In this video, we're going to be looking at the importance of exchange. Once again, we're referring to the AQA AS textbook by Glenn and Susan Tool. This time it's pages 176 to 177. Let's take a look at our objectives. We're going to understand how an organism's size affects its surface area and its volume. We're going to describe how larger organisms cope with having a small surface area to volume ratio. And finally, we'll apply fixed law to understand how exchange surfaces work. Now before we get started, you're going to want to review your notes from AS Unit 1. The topic's about membrane transport. Sorry, but even though you've already sat the exam, the information just can't leave your head. So here's a great link from ESCO. So why do we bother with exchange? Our cells need a constant supply of raw materials for metabolic processes. They also need any waste products removing. So here we have an animal cell. The raw materials it might need are oxygen and glucose, and the waste products might be carbon dioxide and urea. Now this is highly simplified, but it illustrates the point quite nicely. So here's some substances that are exchanged from cell to environment and vice versa. We've got respiratory gases, that's oxygen and carbon dioxide. Nutrients, such as glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, vitamins and minerals. Excretory products, and that's urea and carbon dioxide too. And also metabolic heat can also be thought of as a waste product. So how are these substances exchanged? We've got to ignore heat for this one, sadly. There's passive exchange, which consists of diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. And we've got active exchange, which is active transport, where energy in the form of ATP is required. Let's look at what can restrict exchange. Exchange can only occur where the organism is in contact with the environment, and that's the surface of the organism. There's a problem with this, because the cells that are using up the raw materials are within the organism, not just on the surface. So these cells are making up the volume of the organism. And this becomes a, a big problem as the size of the organism increases. As we can see in the diagram, a single-celled organism has a small surface area, but the larger multicellular organism has a larger surface area. No problem there, you say, but we need to compare surface area to the volume. Here we have a 1mm squared cube. It has a surface area of 6mm squared and a volume of 1mm cubed. Therefore, it has a surface area to volume ratio of 6 to 1. Let's increase the size of the cube to 2mm. Surface area is now 24mm squared. Volume is 8 millimetres cubed. Hmm. The size of the cube has doubled. The surface area has got four times bigger, but the volume is eight times bigger. The surface area to volume ratio of this cube is three to one. We're definitely getting smaller there. Let's try that one more time. We're doubling the size of the cube again to four millimetres. Surface area is going to be 96 millimetres squared. That's a fourfold increase. The volume has increased to 64 millimetres cubed, and that's a massive eight times increase. The surface area to volume ratio is now 1.5 to 1. That's definitely getting smaller as the organism gets bigger. So how can the organism overcome this problem? If evolution hadn't found a way around this, life would be very small indeed. Some organisms have developed a flattened body shape to minimise the distance between their cells and the environment. Other more complex organisms have developed specialised exchange surfaces. The flatworm is a great example of the flattened body shape. The gills of a fish and the lungs of mammals are also great examples of the specialised exchange surface. Now we're going to look at the features of specialised exchange surfaces. They increase the surface area to volume ratio of the organism. They're always very thin to minimise the diffusion distance and they're partially permeable to allow substances to pass, th pass through. They also allow the movement of the environment through or over the surface. For example, water moves over the gills of a fish, and air moves in and out of the lungs of mammals. 
They also allow the movement of the internal transport system, for example, blood. Let's briefly revisit Unit 1 and look at Fick's Law. We know that the rate of diffusion is proportional to the surface area of the exchange surface multiplied by the difference in concentration. And all of that is divided by the length of the diffusion pathway. If we increase any of the factors on the top of the equation, surface area and difference in concentration, this results in faster diffusion. Conversely, if we decrease the factor on the bottom, this will lead to an increase in rate of diffusion too. This all relates to the exchange surfaces. Larger surface area, nice thin diffusion pathway, keeping the concentration gradient as large as possible by moving the environment and the internal transport system through or across the surface. All really useful, all really important. Let's summarise this. Cells must be able to exchange substances with their environment. And this is difficult for larger organisms due to a reduced surface area to volume ratio. Flattened body shapes or specialised exchange surfaces allow for better exchange. Exchange surfaces increase the rate of diffusion by favourably changing the factors of Fick's law. To round things off, here's some extra reading. Here's a great summary by Eskul. Scan the QR code with your smartphone or visit the link at the bottom. Finally, here's an interesting piece of extra reading that explores the implications of surface area to volume ratio, with a little added humour too. Thanks very much for watching.